By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I have a fun match for you. I'm playing against her folk and she's got a very cool deck it's called Primordial Eggs. It's built around prim Primordial Ooze and the Rook Eggs. It's blue and red. And she's taking on my Sleeping Beauty deck, which is a white and green built around Fajern Enchantress and Animate Wall. Yes, you're very correct. Fajern Enchantress and, and Animate Wall. These are two really cool uh, decks you don't see often. So I'm really looking forward to show the matches to you. Uh, but let's first go to the deck text. I've got lovely deck photos of both of these decks. Now, as always, if you want to skip this section of the video, go to the matches first, check out the deck text later. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. So click on there and then it will take you straight to the games and you can check out the deck text later. If you stick around here, we are going to start with the deck text. And you know what? I'm going to start with uh, my deck actually, Sleeping Beauty. Let's have a look. And here we see my deck, Sleeping Beauty. So this deck is white and green. It's inspired by the fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty, which is of course about a princess that gets cursed by her mother-in-law, evil mother-in-law. And then, uh, you know, she's stuck the way deep into the forest and a prince has to save her. Now, I've changed the fairy tale a little bit because, you know, I just like to do that. Obviously, for Jern Enchantress in this tale, is the princess, right? So I'm playing with four princesses in this deck. And then we have... Um, the evil uncle that's uh, on the Lantex, he is kind of the landlord of the Fajern Enchantress and like she's not paying, right? She's living in this big ass castle, but she's not paying the rent. So the evil guy says, you know what? It's been enough. I'm going to lock you up in the highest castle tower until I kind of find someone who's willing to pay your rent or, you know, you got to do chores, whatever. I haven't really figured that out yet, but she's locked away in the castle. He is the evil guy, right? She's not sleeping. She's shouting out of the castle tower. But of course, this castle tower is somewhere tucked away deep into the forest. And then we need the hero, Akron Legionnaire, to try to find her with a huge sword and try to find a way, get away through all the barriers in place. And there are quite a lot of barriers in this deck, right? We, of course, have, because it's in a forest, We've got the uh, the the wall, the four five wall, uh, carn carnivorous plant. Uh, we have, of course, the wall of brambles. We have the wall of wood. I've got a really cool signed copy that I'm just so excited that I can play it because it's been in my binder forever. I never play with it, but now in this storytell deck, I'm like, okay, this is the place for it. If I'm not going to play it in this deck, I'm never going to play it. So it's in this deck. Um, then we also have Wall of Swords because, you know, this is kind of a wall deck. So I'm also playing with animate walls. And I think Wall of Swords and Carnivorous Plant are basically the two walls with the most uh, uh, power for sure, you know, unless, I mean, you could think of Wall of Fire and Wall of Water because you can pump them. But remember, I'm playing green and white in this, so I don't really have space for those cards in here. Um, anyway, so I figured in those colors, these are really the two best walls uh, for what I want to do because I want to put my animate walls on them and kind of attack with them. And later in the game, when I've got my Akron Legionnaire out, I have another way to kind of win the game. And that is, well, I mean, you can attack with Akron Legionnaire, but it's only for toughness. He's very vulnerable. He's probably going to die. So I'd rather sack him to the Sword of the Ages. So Sword of the Ages is, of course, this artifact for six to cast comes into play tapped. Uh, and then you can tap and sack an X amount of creatures and deal damage equal to their power to any target. So if I've got my Akron Legionnaire, if I've got my, my plants, if I've got my Wall of Swords and stuff, you know, and they're kind of pumped up also with the Fortified Area, I can probably like hopefully deal lethal with one good Sword of the Ages sack. I mean, <laughs> I, I didn't say it's a good plan, but it's a plan, right? And I actually have two plans. I've got my plan A plan, which is, you know, play walls, put an animate wall on them and kind of attack with that, maybe kill your kill the opponent. If I don't manage, finish with Sword of the Ages, or if I don't manage to deal any damage at all, simply, you know, make a really big power, you know, stuff on the board with a lot of creatures and use my Sword of the Ages to kill the opponent, deal 20 damage. Is that, that even possible? I mean, I hope so. I'm just going to try it out. And, you know, I've, I've played this deck a few times in the past. It's great fun. I've tweaked it a little bit. So maybe if you've been on the channel before, you'll, you'll, you'll see some differences. It's good. I guess it's also good to kind of discuss for Jern Enchantress. You probably already know what she does, but it's two green and one to cast for this O2 creature. And whenever you cast an enchantment, 
you get to draw a card, which is pretty cool, right? So obviously I'm playing with a lot of enchantments. So I've got, you know, Spiritlings, I've got Castle, Lantex, Fortified Area. I've got, of course, Animate Wolves. I'm not playing with Lana or Elves because I'm playing with Wild Growths because of, of course, the Vajuran Enchantress. And also, I guess, the story, you know, in the story, she falls asleep and then around her, there's all these, you know, plants are growing around the castle where she's falling asleep in. And, you know, it's all thick with greenery. So Wild Grove kind of fits that story as well. Um, I'm also playing with Sylvan Library. And I think Sylvan Library and Fajuran Enchantress is a really good combo because when you play for Fajuran Enchantress and then you're Sylvan, obviously you already get to draw a card. But that card selection with Sylvan Library means you get to dig a little deeper and sort the cards in a way that you always have an enchantment on top and that you can just keep drawing cards. I think personally as well that, you know, if you want to play with enchant creatures like the Animate Wall or, for example, the, the White Ward that's in the sideboard. Uh, oh, I, I so wish I could start casting the White Ward. Not in this match, I guess, you know, because I'm not playing those against those colors. But I just playing a Ward feels really good. But what I wanted to say is if you cast an enchant creature on a creature, it's very risky because you're setting yourself up for a two-for-one, right? That's why hardly anybody plays with enchant creatures. However, when you've got your Fajuran Enchantress, you at least can get some value, right? Because the card replaces itself, kind of making it valid to start playing with these Enchant creatures. So I think if you want to play with Enchant creatures and Enchant lands, Fajuran Enchantress is really the way to go. Anyway, um, this is my deck. Do I have high expectations? Well, you know, I think it can win. I think it can win a game. And if it can win a game, it can also win two games. That's the way I'm looking at it. Do I need some luck? Hell yeah, but I think it's possible. Anyway, this is my deck, Sleeping Beauty. Now let's take a look at the deck of the opponent. And here we see the deck of her folk, and I think it's so cool. So I've called it Primordial Eggs because it's got Primordial Ooze and Rook Egg, and these are really the two key cards in the deck. You know, there's a lot of synergy with these cards, and I think, you know, the first combo I just want to point out is one that I'm really a big fan of. It's Primordial Ooze and Unstable Mutation. So maybe it's good to first look at the Ooze. So the Ooze says... First of all, it has to attack each combat if, if able. It's a legend, a creature from Legends, one red to cast for a 1-1. One, one. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you got to put a plus one, plus one counter on the ooze. Then you may pay X, where X is the number of counters on it. If you don't, tap the ooze and it deals X damage to you, right? So at a certain point, the ooze will be so big, you can no longer pay the mana for it and it starts to hurt you. That's kind of the idea. But in return, you get these, the, you know, this creature that will never stop to grow which is kind of cool, right? Um, now, the combo here is that you can combine this with Unstable Mutation. So it's a card from Arabian Nights. One blue for an enchant creature that says enchant creature gets plus three, plus three. So it's going to make the ooze a 4-4. Four, four. Then at the beginning of your upkeep of enchanted creatures controller, put a minus one, minus one counter on the creature. So what's happening here, because we're playing according to modern rules, a plus one, plus one counter and a minus, a minus one, minus one counter cross each other out. So the moment the ooze gets to counter, it also gets a minus one, minus one counter from the unstable mutation, which means a plus and negative together, they make zero, you know, minus one, plus one equals zero. So there are no counters on the ooze and the ooze remains a 4-4 creature. So that's kind of, you know, decent bang for your buck. Now, if we look at the rest of the deck, the cool thing is she's also playing with Zephyr Falcon and Flying Man, which are great targets for Unstable Mutation as well. So it's not like, and actually the Rook Egg is also a great target for the Unstable Mutation. So the Unstable Mutation has a lot of targets. The Ooze is just one of those targets. Um, we also see the 1-1 the one -one Flyers that I just mentioned, but I want to focus a little bit on the Rook Egg. The Rook Egg is another one of these combo pieces in our deck. So it's an O3 creature from Arabian Nights. And when it dies, um, you get a 4-4 Bird Token at the end of your turn. The cool thing is what you can do is if you have one Rook Egg on board, you can play a Chain Lightning on your own egg, killing your own egg. And because you're the target, remember with Chain Lightning, you can pay two red to choose another target. So then you can pay two red and, for example, kill my Fajuran Enchantress in this, you know, in this matchup. Uh, and, and then you get like a really nice two for one. You get a lot of value. You get a four for bird and, you know, you're, able, you're killing something on the side of your opponent. Guess what? You could also have a scenario where maybe you have two Rook Eggs on board and enough mana to kill both those eggs with Unchained Lightning. That would just be insane. So it, it's a really nice combo. People refer to this as the fried eggs combo, right? Because you're kind of frying your eggs with your Chain Lightning, which I think is really fun. Uh, we also see Bloodlusts in this deck. 
Of course, uh, also a card from Legends gives, gives plus four, minus four to target creature, and the toughness cannot go below one. So again, this works really well with those little 1-1 one, one flyers and also with the Rook Egg. You know, if you attack with the Rook Egg, your opponent is probably not going to block it because, you know, you don't want to kill the Rook Egg. And then, of course, her folk can uh, play the Bloodlust on it and all of a sudden deal four damage. And if the opponent decides to block anyway, hey, also great, it dies. Or, you know, for example, if I would block with my... my um, my Wall of Brambles, which is a 2-3, she can play her, her Bloodlust and make sure that her um, Rook Egg is going to die from those two damage from the Wall of Brambles. So, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of cool synergy, a lot of cool plans. I haven't even mentioned, you know, Earthquake, Rook Egg. And what I like about this deck, I'm really liking the deck photo, you know, those lands on top. And I just, I love the simplicity of the deck. You know, it, it's got a clear battle plan. Um, it's aggressive. I, I think it's a really nice deck to play in a pub, you know, because you, you, you can have a few drinks, you can still pilot this. It's ideal, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm liking it. You know, I think it's cool and, and you're doing cool stuff. Usually in aggro, not that aggro is not cool, but it tends to be a bit linear. Here you've got some tricks in your deck as well, which is kind of nice to show off also. Um, besides the fact that it's kind of cool, it also looks kind of strong, to be honest. I'm it's looking pretty good. I'm a little bit worried. I just hope I can get my walls out in time before I get like kind of fried by this deck. You know, that's kind of my concern. Anyway, this is the deck of her folk. We've looked at my deck, so that means we're ready. Let's go to the match. Game number one. Here we go. Her folk sitting on the left with her uh, primordial eggs deck. So build around primordial ooze and rook egg. Look at that. She's taking a mulligan and she's taking on my sleeping beauty deck. So it's a deck built around for journey, enchantress and walls. It's white and green. And uh, yeah, looking forward to this. Two really original decks. Let's see who's on the play here and who's going to start and how it's going to turn out. I think we're, we're, we're up for, you know, really weird games. Perhaps it's going to be over quite soon because her folks' deck is quite aggressive. But I think if I can stabilize, you know, it could get interesting. Anyway, um, it looks like uh, her folk took a mulligan, right? Down to six. I've got still seven in hand. We're looking at our cards. And let's see who's on the play here. Okay, it's her folk on the play, starting with a Mishra's Factory. Five cards in hand, passing the turn. Let's see what I can do. Do I have a turn one play? I guess I don't with the planes. I do have a Wall of Wood in the deck. So, you know, one green into Wall of Wood would be quite nice. Also playing with four Wild Groves. That would be even better. But just the planes for now. There's an Island for her folk. Tapping two. There's a Sephir Falcon. So the 1-1 one, one Flyer from Legends that you don't have to tap when it attacks. So that's a bit of a nuisance for me. There's a forest. Can I accelerate now with the wild growth? That will be quite nice. Then perhaps next turn I could play a wall of swords to block the sapphire, for example. Nope, I'm just passing the turn, going quite slow. So that means that Herfo can actually hit me for three if she chooses to animate the uh, Mishra's factory. There's a mountain. It looks like she's going to attack first with the sapphire. So I'm going to drop to 19. Tapping the mountain and oh look at that going to drop to 15 instead of bloodlust super aggressive here by merfolk dealing uh, five damage here as fast as she can so that's already in the pocket a quarter of my life gone here there's a savannah the dual land so hopefully uh, I can cast something for during enchantress would be quite nice now. And hopefully I can get some value exactly for Jiren Enchantress. So the O2 creature, whenever I play an enchantment now, I get to draw a card. So hopefully I can start cashing in on that uh, after this turn. Passing on to her folks. So again, it's not looking great for me. She can still animate the Factory and the Zephyr and attack for three. Put me on 12. Tapping. Okay, there's a Primordial Ooze. So that's the 1-1 one, one from Legends and the Unstable Mutation. So we've got the combo on board right now. That's really cool. So this is now a 4-4 four, four creature. And during the upkeep of Herfolk, the Ooze puts a plus 1, plus 1 counter on it. And the Unstable puts a minus 1, minus 1 counter on it. And they cancel each other out. So it means it stays a 4-4. Four, four. So this is exactly what Herfolk wants. And to be honest, I'm getting slaughtered here. You know, I mean, look at this. I'm on 12 at the moment this is a huge problem i have to find a carnivorous plant a wall of sorts something tapping four okay that's a good sign because my better walls have a casting cost of four what am i going to get here okay there's a wall of sorts so a three five flyer so that's a really good wall here that's kind of going to stop her folk from attacking hopefully unless she has another one of those bloodlusts 
So she's gonna draw. The good news here for me also is that her hand's quite empty. Only two cards in hand now after draw step, I believe. There's an island, so only one card in hand tapping four. Okay, there's a rook egg. So it's looking kind of good actually for me. You know, now she has to wait until maybe she finds another unstable mutation or, you know, a bloodlust or something, or maybe a lightning. Like she's got a lot of options, but she doesn't have a lot of card draw in her deck. So for me, this is a good situation, right? I've got my wall of swords, I'm on 12. Hopefully I can find an enchantment here to get some value. I mean, that would be really sweet. And remember, the, the ooze has to... Oh yeah, actually the ooze, I think her focus mentioning this now. The ooze has to attack every turn. So we're kind of going back in time here. So the ooze is attacking, I'm blocking it, of course, on the, um, on the Wall of Swords. And now I'm taking my turn. Okay, there's a fortified area. This is actually relevant. All walls get plus one, plus zero, and I get to draw a card from the Enchantress, meaning my Wall of Swords is now a four or five. It can kill the Ooze. And this is, of course, a problem here for her folk. You know, she's going to lose two cards next turn, which is kind of painful. Oh, and there's a Spirit Link. I can start gaining some life. And of course, I am keep drawing cards because I've got the Enchantress on board. So that Enchantress staying alive is, of course, vital to my game plan, to anybody who's playing with an Enchantress. That's, of course, also the problem with these type of decks. You know, your opponents start to point that removal towards the Enchantress in no time. Anyway, here's the attack. So I'm going to block with the Wall of Swords, dealing four points of damage with the Wall, gaining four life from my Spirit Link, and also killing the Ooze. So, I mean, this is just a great moment for me, really getting back into here, uh, into it, I mean, with, uh, with 16 now in total, which is quite nice. And now I need to kind of find a way to, you know, deal some damage here to her folk. Finding an animate wall, that would be super cool right now. I could put it on my wall of sorts, draw another card, that would be ideal. Playing three animate walls in my deck. Tapping six here. Okay, there's a Sword of the Ages. So Sword of the Ages, an artifact from Legend, co Legends, comes into play tapped. When it's untapped, you can tap and sack an X amount of creatures and deal damage equal to their power combined. Right? So if I would sack my Wall of Swords, I can deal four, uh, damage to any target. Obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's not in there to just deal four damage. There's an attack with the egg. I mean, I'm probably not going to block, right? Let's see what I'm going to do. Oh, I am actually blocking here on the Wall of Swords. And I'm saying, you know, if you get a 4-4, I don't really mind. And I do get some life. Ooh, there's the Bloodlust. So I wasn't blocking. I am taking the damage here. And now I'm dropping here to 12. So I was thinking about, for a moment I thought I blocked because I had made that gesture towards the Wall of Swords. And I think I still could have blocked. Then again, she could have kept the Bloodlust for her bird token. I wonder, to be honest, I wonder if it was a good decision here to play the, the Bloodlust. Maybe it's better to kind of keep it, you know, for a rainy day. Here we see the uh, City of Brass hitting the board. I mean, imagine if she would have kept the Bloodlust earlier in the game, she could have used it on the Ooze. Although I understand her, her game plan is aggressive, right? So I do kind of get that part. Uh, but you do need to find a way to get rid of these big, uh, big walls. So two Wall of Swords. Now remember, because of the fortified area, they're both 4-5, not 3-5. So uh, it's already 8 power of damage with the Sword of the Ages on the board. Of course, that's not enough. Her folks still being on 20. And uh, yeah, I just really need to find a card like Sylvan Library um, or an Animate Wall, you know, would be great to start attacking. But uh, as long as that doesn't happen... You know, I'm just passing the turn and also giving her folk time to kind of build up her, her army and maybe find an opening at a certain point. So she's got, I believe, just one card in hand. It's kind of difficult for her playing against these walls because I'm thinking even if you have an unstable mutation, do you really want to play it on an egg? Yes, it's going to kill your egg eventually, but quite slowly. And, you know, the 3-6, I can block it easily with my walls. And I'm not even sacrificing anything by doing it, so... You know, I can imagine if I would now draw into an unstable, I think I would just keep it in hand. 
looks like we're now discussing kind of the board state. I'm explaining the fortified area. I'm talking about the uh, sort of the ages. Now remember, fortified area also gives banding to my walls. So that makes it even less attractive for her folk to, to even think of an attack. Three cards in hand still. Looks like I just uh, found more land passing the turn here. I've got a lot of land. Both of us do, actually. Here we see her folk tapping for, oh wow, another Rook X. So almost a full play set of Rook X now on board for her folk. I mean, if she can find, for example, an Earthquake or, you know, actually what would be really cool if she can find another Mountain and then play a Chain Lightning. She could fry two of her own eggs, get two four fours. Oh, animate wall in the building. Yeah, this is the moment that I was kind of waiting for. Now I can attack with my four five. And again, I'm getting a card from that Enchantress. This is just amazing. Anyway, attacking here with the four five with a spirit link on it. So even if her folk blocks, it's still good for me because I'm going to go up to 16. And it looks like she does block. Nope, she's not. Okay, for a moment I thought she was blocking. Anyway, she's taking the damage here. So she's dropping to 16 and I'm going up four points. I'm going up to 16. So our life totals are the same. It looks like I'm going to cast something else here. Tapping four. Could that be a carnivorous plant perhaps? Yeah, carnivorous plant. Nice little uh, note about this card from the dark. It was the first wall that didn't have the word wall in its name. So a lot of people were confused by this. And they thought, hey, I can just attack with it because it's not a wall. It's called Carnivorous Plant. So it's just a 4-5 I can attack with. Which is funny because then it would be a really, really good card. But it is a wall. You cannot attack with it. No matter what people tell you. You need an animate wall to attack with it. But uh, yeah, it's looking quite good from here. I can just attack again with my 4-5. Now we do see her folk blocking this, tapping three. Oh, I'm liking this play, Sayani Blast. Wow, that is really good. So playing a Sayani Blast here to kill the uh, Wall of Swords. Of course, she, she did block it with the Sefri Falcon. She needs an extra, you know, one point of damage. So she needs to put that into the yard still. And I'm also gaining, of course, the life from the Spirit Link because first you have this block with the Sephir. The Sephir dies and then she played the uh, Psionic Blast, killing the wall. So she, she still has to put that, uh, that Sephir away. I'm sure we're going to fix that problem in a moment. I mean, if Sephir would have, have, have had first strike, then you can do it, right? Because first strike damage happens first, and then you can play the, the Psionic Blast. Let's see what I'm doing now. Tapping. Exactly. Now the Sephir is going. Putting an Animate Wall here. Again, this is great. Remember, it's a 4-5 because of Fortified Area. Now it can attack for 4. There's a Wild Growth drawing another card. I mean, she's on 14. I can put her on 10. And I mean, that's sort of the ages. I've got that for nine. Oh, there's a castle. This is really sweet. This is what I want to do in life, right? Castle and fortified area together on the board. How often have you seen that? I mean, that's just, that's poetry. I find that poetry, but it's my opinion. Anyway, attacking for four, putting her folk on 10, taking a damage. What else am I going to do? Can I find another? I can, another wool. And now I can win the game, sacking it. The, all the walls to sort of the ages, meaning I can deal a uh, 10, 14 points of damage here to her folk, putting her on minus four, winning a game number one. I mean, this is this is what I want to do, man. This is it feels so good when you're when you're brewing a deck and your plan actually works. Because in a lot a lot of times it doesn't. So I'm I'm enjoying this moment. It's great. But remember, this is just game one. We're gonna dive into our sideboards and we will catch back up with you in game number two. Game number two, here we go. Her folk on the play, starting with an island, six in hand, passing the turn. No turn one play for, for her, no flying man, so that's good news. Let's see what I can do. Turn one. Can I find a wild growth? That would be kind of kind of cool. Ramping up a little bit. Nope, I cannot. Just passing the turn with a forest. So her folk, of course, uh, having lots of cards that she can potentially play out. There's the Sephir Falcon, one of them, of course. So Sephir, the 1-1 one, one Flyer from Legends, back on board. And here we see a Plains from my side of the table. Passing the turn. 
Hmm. Yeah, of course, bopping me for one. Boop. Going to 19. Oh, doing the same thing again as she did in game two. Okay, sure, her folk, go for it. I'm on 15 again. I mean, what I need to do is the same as uh, what I did here in game one. It's just stabilized right now. Exactly. Tapping three, I hope. Play out the Vajern Enchantress. Hopefully. Question mark. Is it the Enchantress? Yes, it is. Okay, now. Let's pray that it can stick. Remember, her folk does have four chain lightnings, four lightning bolts that we didn't see in game one. I was quite lucky with that. So, um, yeah, I'm a little bit worried that she has the power to fry my lady. But if she doesn't, then hopefully I can start drawing some cards next turn. That will be pretty sweet. Let's first see what her folk can do here in her turn. Turn number three. Oh, chain lightning. Roasting the lady here. And also looking at her hairdo, I think there's a lot of hairspray in there. So when it get, gets hit by lightning, it's not a pretty sight. Oh, there we see a uh, unstable. Dang, taking four points, dropping to 11. This is not going well. I mean, I need Spirit Link would be kind of nice. Or Wall of Swords, of course, would be good. Yeah, there's a Spirit Link. Okay, so... I mean, it would have been so sweet if I, exactly, if I still would have had my Enchantress, it would have given me a card. There is a Wall of Wood, signed by Mark Ted in 03 Wall, for one green. I mean, what's not to love, you know, about uh, a Wall of Wood? Three toughness for one green. I mean, that's fantastic. Passing the turn here to her folk. Of course, she's uh, getting a minus one, minus one counter from the uh, Unstable, so it's now a 3-3. Uh, three, three. Remember the... Uh, Spirit Link is on there. Another Sephir, though. But at least I'm not taking any damage this turn. So, again, hopefully I can, you know, find a Wall of Swords or something. Another Enchantress would be quite good as well. Playing, of course, a full playset of the Fajern Enchantress. There's the Carnivorous Plant. So, that's kind of useful against the Ooze. I think the five toughness is really difficult for her folk to deal with, right? Because she's playing with uh, Lightning Bolt, Chain Lightning, Psionic Blast. So it's really difficult for her. It's, it's always a two for one if she wants to get rid of a five toughness creature. So that's difficult for her. Tapping a blue here. Oh, another unstable. That's unfortunate for me. She can hit me for four here with the, uh, the one Sephir that's not enchanted. I'm going to drop here to seven, I believe. Oh, wow, Bloodlust, even worse. Gonna drop to three life. Am I gonna die next turn? I got three cards in hand, keeping my fingers crossed here. Hopefully I can find something. A wall of sorts will be enough to protect me, but I need to find something. Oh man, I remember with Spirit Link, you first take the damage, then get the life. So there could be a scenario where you're dead. Yeah, animate wall. That's kind of cute, but it's not going to save me attacking here with the 4-5 wall, hoping that her folk is going to block. She actually does. So this is good news for me because I'm gaining some life here from the spirit. Like, I think it's a little mistake by her folk. Probably just should have taken the damage here because now I'm going to go up to 5, meaning I bought myself another turn, which is all I can really ask for, you know, at this uh, stage in the game. Because I believe that that Sephir is now going to be a 3-3. Three, three, so she's going to attack put me on 2. Really need to take that Spirit Link uh, out. Exactly put it in the graveyard. Passing the turn here to her folk. There's the attack. So she's going to put me on 2. Ah, oh, Lightning Bolt. That is unfortunate. So probably she already had the Bolt when she decided to block... The carnivorous plant, you know, knowing that, you know, I've got the bolt anyway to finish. But, uh, yeah. Dang, that's, I think the big difference here is, well, I think I know we've seen it, but in game one, the enchantress get to stick on the board, and that just gave me a lot of value, you know, to, to, to find more cards. And she did what she has to do in game two, which is kill the enchantress on sight. But I've got a game three. I can start the game. You know, it's 1-1. One, one, I'm hopeful. Game number three is about to start. Oh, look at that. It looks like I'm taking a mulligan. Starting with six. Her folk also on six, I believe. So I'm on the play here. So that's good, I guess. You know, I can play out my walls faster. So there's a Savannah. Again, no Wild Grove. So I, I haven't had a single turn one Wild Grove, which is kind of annoying. 
And I didn't see a single Sylvan either, you know? I think Sylvan is, is really good in my deck. Anyway, enough with the complaining. It's 1-1. Hopefully, you know, I can uh, get a victory here. P playing a Plains, her folk played a uh, Mishra's Factory. So passing their turn back to her here. Let's see who's going to play the first non-land permanent. There's a mountain. Is she going to play anything out or is she going to animate and attack for two? Which is risky because I do run disenchants in the deck. Animating, attacking for two. Taking the damage to no disenchants. And uh, drawing for turn here. Playing a forest. Do I have a Fridurn Enchantress? That's the question. That would be quite nice. Could also play out a Wall of Brambles, for example. Nope, just passing the turn again. That is not great. You really want to see a Fridurn Enchantress here uh, as soon as you hit the three mana. There's another Mishra's uh, factory here. So that means you can pump it up to a 3-3 three, three if she chooses to animate an attack. Let's see what's going to happen. Animating here. Oh, into the red zone. Pumping it up here. Taking damage again. Dropping to 15. This is really not great. You know, her folk is not doing that much. But I've already taken 5 points of damage, which is uh, kind of frustrating. Tapping 3 here. Okay, I guess I found an Enchantress from the top. Tapping, okay, finding a wild growth. So this is quite good, right? Because I have instant value. So even if her folk now has a bolt, at least I got a card back from my enchantress, which is good news. I mean, there is a really good attack again, of course, for her folk here. You know, she can again attack with the uh, factories. Finding an island here. Perhaps we're going to see a Sephir Falcon. That's another option. Play a Sephir, and then she's got, for example, the mountain left to pump. I guess she's not doing that, though, attacking here with the factory. So I'm just going to take the damage here. Don't want to lose my Enchantress. So taking an extra point, pumping it with the other factory. Oh, and there's a bolt on the Fridurn Enchantress. Yeah, I mean, you kind of know it's coming, but you hope that you're lucky, like in game one, and it can kind of stick. But uh, absolutely dead now in no time. Tapping three, so a two green, a white. Okay, there's another Enchantress. Hopefully, keeping my fingers crossed, hopefully this can stick. It would be so good if I could just play out, you know, a Sylvan right now. I guess this is not too shabby to Spirit Link. Just want to replace it quickly, get some value out of the Enchantress. Counting the amount of lands. I think I haven't played out a land yet because I had a land drop and I was on the play, so... I think that's correct. Three cards in hand, passing the turn to her folk. But of course, you don't really want to play a Spirit Link on your Fridurn Enchantress. But I guess I'm kind of digging for stuff. And of course, I wanted to value out of the Enchantress. Maybe I just have three lands in hand, for example, and, and I really, you know, want to have a wall. Or maybe I've got Animate Wall in hand, you know? That's really a dead card right now. There is, again, the Animate... And the pump, so I'm taking three more points of damage. Nope, seven points of damage after the Bloodlust. That is kind of brutal. Dropping to five here. And I have to say the Bloodlusts are really doing a lot of work. And I mean, it's perfect for her folk because I'm not playing with Swords to Plowshare. So she doesn't have to worry about that when, uh, when dropping the Bloodlust. Oh, look at this. Just finding a land and passing. I'm just completely land flooded, I guess. I probably have lands or animate walls in my hand, you know? I remember with animate wall, I think you can only enchant walls. I cannot play that on my enchantress to kind of like cycle the card away. And the problem as well is I cannot play spirit link on the Mishra's factory. So I just really need the disenchant. There's the attack. Oh man, am I gonna die here to factories? Look at that, gonna block, I'm dead, desperate. I'm just afraid that maybe she's got another bloodlust and I'm dead. I just don't want to take the risk. Oh man, this is really bad. I'm on five. Like, she can get me to one next turn, another Savannah. I mean, if this game would be about 
getting the most land on the table, I would be definitely be winning. Although her folks got a nice collection as well, but this is just bad. Nothing here. And, and actually, her folk is not doing much, but... Okay, there's a Rook Egg. Attacking here, probably pumping it up to three. I'm on two. I mean, I'm, I really feel that, that you know, her folk is giving me the time in this game three to kind of show what my deck can do, but um, it's probably too little too late. I'm on two here. Finally finding a blocker. Yep, and there's the animate wall, right? I could I could kind of sense it. Oh man, I I, I remember I remember this. I remember this. I remember looking looking at her and like, oh man, you're just slaughtering me and but very slowly. So you're giving me time, but I just cannot find the right cards. And you know, magic can be quite uh, frustrating sometimes. And Herfolk tapping for what are we going to see? Oh, there's an Earthquake. That's pretty sweet. Earthquake to finish the game here. And uh, also to kind of show that synergy between Earthquake and Rook X. That's quite nice. And I have to say, Herfolk, I really enjoy playing against your deck. I think it's a really cool deck. Uh, it was a fun match. But yeah, this third game was a little bit frustrating for me because I just couldn't find anything else but Lance. Uh, but yeah, besides that, it, it was a really a fun match. It's always fun to play against Herfolk. She's been on the channel before. Congratulations, Herfolk, with your victory. Here you can see her deck, by the way. It's a, it's a really neat deck. I'm liking all the tricks. Um, yeah, it's just sweet. So thank you for, for the match. Um, Herfolk, by the way, is a patron of the channel. So if you maybe want to play a match against me as well, please check out patreon.com slash timmytalks. Uh, to find out how you can become a patron and if you support me at a certain patron level we can also play a game together and maybe even make an episode together like this one with her folks so uh yeah check out patreon.com slash timmy talks for more information and uh before you go please leave a like a comment and share this video on your socials all these things are free and really help the channel move forward and of course if you're not a subscriber yet please hit that subscribe button and ring that bell Right? All these, all, these, all these things help. All these things help. So if you did that, thank you so much. And uh, now I guess we are ready to go to the end scroll.